Well, good morning, Gospel Hope. You may be seated. I see some of you are already doing that, which is great. You kind of know the... Good morning, sir, and I appreciate you as well. Well, if you are a guest of Gospel Hope Church, and particularly if this is your first time worshiping with us, we'd like to uh, greet you this morning. Uh, could, would you just kind of show your hand? I promise you won't have to stand up and make any special announcements or introductions. I see those hands. <laughs> Praise God for you, and we look forward to uh, continuing to worship with you. If on your way in you did not receive um, a gift from us, we have something for you at the Connect table, and we would love to um, have you to, t uh, to receive that before you leave and um, perhaps even get a chance to officially introduce ourselves to you. Um, also, if you are a guest or you've been visiting uh, in and out, uh, you may be aware that we are in a series entitled Generous. And uh, today we reached the end of that series. And so if you are interested in seeing where we have been and how we got to the point in the text where we are today, uh, feel free to um, look these messages up online as we have been working through uh, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. Uh, but let's uh, go before the Lord and ask for his help this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come and we need your help. We underscore are hope in a variety of different ways. You know them in their entirety. I just describe the ones that are kind of at the top of mind. Um, we need you as both the preacher and the hearer of your word, that there would be a demonstration of your spirit and not necessarily, Lord God, a demonstration of uh, anything short of that, not a demonstration of personality, not a demonstration of wit or intellect, Lord God. We need a demonstration of your spirit. We desperately ask, O oh Holy God and Father, that you would help us in our understanding of generosity. That you would, from your text, help us to access your heart and see the broader implications of generosity and the gospel. Pray, O oh God, that you would help us not to do any damage in our heads or in our hearts to, to the subject. Pray, O oh God, that we would be careful to hear what you are saying and that we would be open to transformation based on how you speak. Pray, O oh God, that you would locate the sin in our lives concerning this topic. Point to it specifically, put your hand on it, Lord God, that we would be swift to bring it to you and to repent. Lord God, wherever we have damaged views, would you, would, would, you, would you smooth that out? Would you redeem our damaged views on this topic? Would you, Lord God, give instruction and wisdom in righteousness where we are unclear on how to move forward in certain aspects of this topic? Would you train us and equip us to more dutifully serve you through the lens of this topic, but above all things, oh God, would you glorify yourself in giving us a clearer view of yourself, your son, Jesus Christ, and your purposes through what you've intended when it comes to generosity and its unique relationship to the gospel. Would you arm us, oh God, with a very concentrated view of your work where we would also be inclined to share it into the lives of others within our respective context. This we ask in the matchless and holy name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Just a little bit of a why. Uh, why did we choose, as we close this, why did we choose to do a series on generosity? Uh, not so that we could raise funds, but so that we could raise faith. So that we could increase our capacity to trust God in this area of our lives, despite the fact that we indeed live in a society that if left without the word of God filling the vacuum would live us, leave us with a very vile and warped understanding of economics, finances, and generosity. Let's just be honest, every single one of us in the room, if we have not been the direct participants in, we have been the observers of misappropriation of cash, funds, illegitimate teaching on the subject of generosity, so much to the point that some of us have chosen to create as much distance between ourselves as we possibly can and to even not just eisegete the text, but to isolate ourselves from any passage of the scripture that would speak on the topic. 
That's how traumatized we are by some of the things that have happened per the hand and the trick of the enemy in our culture. And so we don't redeem the subject or redeem our hearts on it by leaving it in a vacuum state. We fill that vacuum with the right things in the word of God rather than avoiding the topic. That's why. We also, why? Because we have a commitment when it comes to preaching God's word to preach the whole council, not to leave anything off the table, to leave no meat on the bone. We want to progress through the text in ways that, 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 that represent a respect for God's scriptures, and we're not, we're not afraid of the topic. That's some of the why. When you look at today's passage, particularly 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 15, you immediately recognize that God is using, through the agency and the person of Paul, some very particular language that is unique and specific to farming. Let's see if we can follow it. Beginning with verse 6, it says, the point is this, building on a previous argument, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has purposed or decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Interesting. What's up with the farming language? Last week, uh, our family went down to Florida. Per the request of our in-laws, my mother-in-law in particular, Dolores, who is planning to move to Atlanta um, later this year, had asked that we could have Thanksgiving and celebrate it as a family at her, home, her Florida home one last time. When we pulled up in the driveway and I got out of the car, my heart smiled. I chuckled for a moment because as I observed the landscape of her property, I immediately recognized all of the flowers and foliage. She had done an incredible job of multiplying and planting all of these flowers and I could recognize each one of them because she had gotten most of them from me. One of the great relationships between me and my mother-in-law is that I'll often, when she comes, whether they Pearl Harbor us and surprise us or whether they announce their arrival, I'll hear the ring camera say, there's movement in the backyard. There's movement in the front yard. There's movement in the driveway. And I'll look out and I'll see some person walking around observing my flowers. And so what happens between she and I is a regular discussion. She says, whenever I come to town, if you've got any new flowers, I always love them. She loves flowers. And so she'll come and she'll see a flower that I have planted and she'll, she'll say, Rod, can I have a piece of that? And I say, sure, go ahead. She'll take a piece and I'm assuming she'll just put it in a pot, maybe sit it on a window seal and enjoy it. But no, I go to her house in Florida and these plants that I have that die every single year and I have to repurchase because of our climate, she has this massive foliage. I mean, they're all the way around the pool and they're up and down the stairs and they're climbing the side of the house. Like the, I, I originally purchased this thing called a mandevilla because I love the way that when I saw it, that it would creep up the lattice. And I purchased, I have to purchase mandevilla every single year because it just doesn't tolerate the Georgia cold. But it, it thrives in Orlando. It grows all year long. 
uh, cana lilies and, and, and coleuses and, and other, uh, the Prince of Persia and all these other plants that I've had at various times that I've lived in this house for the last 15 years. She has iterations of them in, in just bountiful supply all around her home because she takes this small portion and she takes it down to her house and she multiplies it. And you know what? I'm stoked when I see it because you know what I say? I may not have done this, but I had a hand in that. I was the one who originally purchased those flowers of which she took a piece and then planted and multiplied in her own space. And so I'm a stoked sower. And I believe that in today's text, that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be a stoked sower, a person who is stoked by the idea of sowing and generosity. I believe that through the genius of the Holy Spirit, the pen of Paul and the personality that God has given him and all his gifts, that God is also doing something else. He is liberating us from some of the limitations that we place on the topic of finances by bringing in this farming analogy so that we can see it more liberally and not just view it through the lens of Wall Street. And therefore, he talks to us like farmers. So as he's speaking to us like farmers, there are four couplets in today's text that I want to explore that really unpack what our relationship with generosity and the gospel should look like. The four couplets are, will appear on the screen in just a moment. They are as follows, sparingly and bountifully, reluctantly and cheerfully, faithlessly and faithfully, conditionally, or liberally. As we look at the passage, and the Lord is using this, again, agricultural language, is this unique to this particular text or the New Testament? And the answer is absolutely no. I believe that mankind's original job description was that of the farmer. After all, we were placed in a garden and told to dress and to keep it. And one of the most interesting punishments placed upon us when we fell short of God's glory was that the ground would no longer agriculturally respond to Adam the way that it used to prior to his sin. When the Lord decided to destroy the earth through the, the uh, flood during the Noahic era, when Noah and his family came off of the ark, one of the first conversations that God had with him is that as long as there is springtime and harvest, as long as there is, is, is summer and winter, I will no longer destroy the earth in the way that I have done. The earth is not going to begin to do what it's supposed to do. And so again, we have this agricultural invite to appreciate and see the goodness of God. When the, when the Lord called Israel to be his people, one of the primary expressions of God's favor and promise on them was the productivity of their land. And also one of the primary pinch points when they fell short of God's glory was the lack of production in their land. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, you know the classic prayer, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and heal their heal their land. There were other seasons in, in the life of Israel and God's own people where one of, the, one of the premier indications of his punishment and his disfavor on them was that the sword of a foreign nation would be able to come into their land, pestilence would impact their livestock, and famine would do, do, do a number on their crops. And so God has always been speaking to his people in this kind of agricultural language. But the Bible goes even further. It isn't just assigned it to our unique relationship with what's happening in the ground and his favor on us. We also see in places like uh, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. The Bible advances the conversation of this reaping and sowing in this way. He says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. The one who sows to his own flesh will also reap corruption. And the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. 
And let us not grow weary in good doing, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. The Bible is littered with agricultural language and this whole idea of reaping and sowing and how it encompasses not just the economic life, but things that are all things spiritual and all things material. And so when we arrive at our focus text and look at verse 6, it says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. I believe that the major idea that I want to drive home today that I believe is is right here in the text is that when we give, we are not only meeting a need, but we are also planting a seed. When we give, we are not only meeting a need, an immediate need that may have been announced from the podium, an immediate need that we may realize in the life of someone around us, an immediate need that may live within a missions organization to which we support, immediate need that exists within the lives of someone around us that we see a need. When we give, we are not only meeting a need, but we are also planting a seed. How is this true? Well, verse six says that we will reap in proportion to how we sow. You see that? If you reap sparingly, you'll sow sparingly. If you reap bountifully, you will sow bountifully. So there is a correspondence. There is, my reaping is proportionate to my sowing. Now, if just for a moment, regardless of what kind of heartburn I have on the topic of money, right? If I can just step into the farming analogy that God has given us in the text, and I really believe that when I give, I am not just meeting a need, but planting a seed, and I begin to view my resources as seeds, and I should be farming with them, if I really believe that, here's what's going to happen in my life. I am going to sow broadly, I am going to sow regularly, I am going to sow carefully, and I am going to sow spiritually. I'm going to sow in every area of my life if God is really calling me a farmer. And I really believe that if I plant and sow sparingly, that I will reap in a corresponding way. Uh, Behind our home, we don't own it. Our home just abuts 196 acres of undeveloped land. For the last 15 or so years, when we first got in the house, I was always trying to find out who owned it, and I did call them and find them, and I begged that they would give me a piece of it because I wanted to expand the piece of property behind my house and also create a little bit of buffer when they built the next section of the subdivision so I wouldn't have to have my neighbors that close. But more than that, I wanted a space to plant things because I, if, if, if I'm truly, if I got this farmer thing going, I want to maximize the space that has been given to me. If you really believe that, I have a neighbor two houses down, a young lady, uh, an older lady by the name of Eloise, who, who she, she saw me moving some trees, and she went and she moved out some trees, and she went to the furthest edge of her property that she could, and she goes out and she plants regularly, she plants broadly, and she plants frequently, and she plants carefully. She she maximizes the space that has been given to her. She sees this land that is behind her home, and she wants all these different varieties, and so she's sowing all these different types of seeds. And it is a beautiful thing to see what she's doing, because as she reaps a harvest, even from this modest garden of hers, I see her, even to me and others, she's giving squash and tomatoes and pumpkins and peppers, and she'll even inquire, do you eat this because I have lots of it? because she is reaping bountifully based on how she's sown. But she also reaps regularly. She doesn't want to miss the season. She knows what grows at what times and when the optimal times are to place that seed in the ground to make it do exactly what it does. She reaps carefully. She's always poking and prodding and putting various things on the ground. She's careful to put a a fence around it and to put these aluminum sleeves around the bases of her trees so that squirrels can't climb and take away her peaches. She's very careful about it. I believe that that the gospel is not just for Eloise. I believe that this analogy is for each one of us, that I too in my life, if I really view what God has given to me like that of a farmer, I want to regularly sow, I want to frequently sow, and I want to bountifully sow to the maximum edges of whatever property God has given me. Jesus also decided to get in on the farming analogies. You remember in Mark chapter 4? 
He told us in his conversation about the gospel and how it works when it hits certain types of soil. You remember that? Mark chapter 4, Jesus gets in on the agricultural analogy. And he says, sometimes when you throw seed, it falls on hard ground and it gets stolen by the adversary before it germinates in belief. But the other seeds, it may not get stolen, but it may indeed get strangled by other growth that comes up around it when, when it produces. Other times it may get scorched because it grows up too fast and doesn't have depth of root. And then he gets to the fourth kind of seed and he says, you know what? But this seed goes into good ground and it strives and it produces a hundredfold, multiple folds, way more bountifully than what was originally planted. There is no doubt in my mind, if you're ready to go to the nerd fest with me, there is no doubt in my mind that that analogy, that premier analogy of Jesus about the planting of the gospel was in the heart and mind of Paul when he goes to the Corinthian church and writes his first letter and says, hey, you guys are bickering over who baptized you. Listen, y'all, I planted, Apollos watered, God created the growth, you are his harvest and you are his field. The Corinthian saints are this robust, bubbling church that is, that is I mean, just a, just a diamond in the ancient Near East. They're, they're growing, they're doing well, and they now see themselves as being the product of gospel seeds that have been planted. So then, in the second letter, as Paul talks to him about generosity, he says, let's pull back from the, from, the, from the currency conversation and let's talk a little bit more about the gospel growth and generosity and seed planting. And their antennas, I'm certain, would go up because they had heard from Jesus or heard from Paul, wait a minute, we are the product of planting. We are the beneficiaries of great gospel seeds have been planted. We are the beneficiaries of someone other, some other churches and other people's generosity who we did not know that came before us. We are God's field. We are God's fruit. And so he invites them into the farming analogy to see themselves as both the fruit of what God is doing as well as the farmers who are now able to do it. Look at it there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are his field, and you are his building. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24, we get this. It says, one gives freely, and yet he grows all the richer. Another withholds, and, he, and that's what he should give, and he only suffers one. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters himself will also be watered. Why do we share this? If God views me as a farmer, then I want to use my funds as a means to make the kingdom more fruitful. If God is viewing me through the lens of a farmer, then I want to use my funds to make the kingdom more fruitful. This is, if, if we let this radically change, transform the way we view our finances, it would it would redeem the way we spend in every category of life because, Lord, this is a handful of seeds that you've given me. I'm not just purchasing Netflix. I'm planting seeds. So the God wants us to know first is our unique role as farmers with the gospel and with other forms of generosity that we can sow sparingly or we can sow bountifully. He goes forward though. Look at verse 7. Each one must give as he has purposed or as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves the cheerful giver. He must give as he has purposed in his heart. There's a phrase that is used a couple of times in the Bible, uh, but only two times in the New, in the New Testament. And it is the cardio diagnostes. It is that God is the one who knows the hearts of men. The cardio diagnostes. And what's interesting is when we give, when we give reluctantly or cheerfully, my heart is being projected in the way that I sow. The Lord sees my heart. I may never see your heart, but the Lord sees your heart. Now, let me tell you something. I, I'm sitting at the kitchen table or various places around the house where I'm working on the message, talking to myself, waiting for people to leave and stop asking me questions. And I'm like, Lord, help me out on this. 
because I want to be a cheerful giver. And I'm looking up the word for cheerful, and it's the Greek word hilarious. I was like, I don't view giving as being hilarious. Help me out. I'm not, I'm not reluctant. I don't feel like my arm is twisted and I have to, but I feel kind of emotionally neutral sometimes. Now, I am blessed by some of the fruit that I see that comes from giving, but I was honest, like, Lord, help me out. What does it look like to be a cheerful giver? And then he goes, you remember this? I was, oh, wow. We got this photo album in our front room that uh, um, we haven't had a chance to put all the pictures in the sleeve. And so there's these little bags of photos. And there's one of them from Carrie's bridal shower, which I did not attend. I don't get invited to a lot of bridal showers. But I know what bridal showers, what they look like because I see them on Carrie's photos. And then also I see them on the Hallmark Channel. And here's what I love about bridal showers. The bride is sitting there, and uh, you know, after the games and whatever else y'all be doing, there is this time when all of the contributors or, or those who have given, she sits down and begins to open boxes and bags and envelopes. And one of the great moments about what's happening there is that the bride is excited, but also those who are in the audience are excited for her to see her reaction and how she is blessed by what they have given. And I was like, I get it, Lord. I have been to a bridal shower because every time I give in the local church, I am showering your bride. I am getting a chance to be a blessing to your bride. I get a chance to see the look on her face when she opens that envelope or that box or that bag or that thing that I've decided to contribute. Now hear me carefully. At a bridal shower, there are some women in the audience who cannot so much as afford two bottles of nail polish and others who could put down a check to pay off your entire mortgage. But regardless of what's in those envelopes, every woman in the audience is smiling and leaning in to see the impact on the bride's face because their heart beats for the bride. And remember that little Greek word I told you? That the God is the cardiodiagnostes. So I don't see your heart when you give, but the Lord does. And he's looking at that heart to see if that thing was reluctant, if it was begrudging, if it was conditional, if it was hurtful or if it was cheerful, if it was hilarious. And so I'm, I'm with you, I'm right there. Every time I give, it's not necessarily hilarious, but I'm saying, Lord, would you help me get there? And here's why I can do it. And I want to, this is a, a small, this is just a, just a little small outtake. <laughs> at Men and Meat um, yesterday, I was sitting at the table with a group of brothers, and one of them asked me, he says, Pastor Rod, in your busy schedule, are you ever tempted to use chat GTP to write your sermons? <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not. And I have been thinking about that. I was up to like 12 o'clock last night doing a bunch of stuff, but I was thinking about that. I was like, what's my theology on chat DTP and sermon prep? <laughs> and I was like, the reason that I do not use an artificial intelligence to write my sermon is what you just saw right there. When I am making a message, the Lord is also making me. And I would never want to adulterate that process in the expediency of getting my assignment done for the week. And so I, I go on record and say that any pastor that is using chat TTP rather than getting done by God's word is committing adultery against the sacred desk. I'm not just a pastor, I'm a patient. Under the scalpel of God's word, there is stuff that needs to be worked out in me. Lord, thank you for showing me what it means to be a cheerful giver. I preached this in the 9 o'clock service, and I got officially invited to a bridal shower. <laughs> it's just paying dividends all over my life. <laughs> but the Lord is looking at our hearts. A biblical example of this is unfortunately found in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. They saw very robust styles of giving taking place, 
and they just sold a piece of property and held back some of the proceeds, but presented it as if that was all of the money. The apostle said to them, you have not lied to man, but you have lied to God because he sees your heart. So, so the Bible doesn't want us to feel like we have to give out of peer pressure because everybody else is doing it. He wants us to sit before him and do something in our hearts where we are transformed in our ideas of generosity. And so I would beg you, if you're, if you're sitting on the bench, take your heart before the Lord and say, Lord, analyze this heart. Do your diagnostics. Show me what's going on with me. I don't want to sit out of the game. You've called me to be a farmer, and I want to be a good one. We want to give not sparingly but bountifully. We want to give cheerfully and not reluctantly. I want to give in a way that where God is checking my heart to see if it beats for the bride or if it is grieved by the bride. I've never been to a bridal shower where it happens, but I've heard about it on some of these shows. There's a lady in the room who maybe doesn't like the bride because she's marrying a man that she thought she was supposed to have. She's a part of the invite. She would never share that begrudgingly, but it definitely shows up in the way that she's looking at her opening the gifts. How dare she ask for that on her registry? Don't you know how much that mixer cost? Each time we give, the Lord is looking at that heart. Are we grieved by the bride and her needs and what she's doing? Or does our heart beat for the bride? And are we cheerful when we see her cherished? Verse 8. It gets faster after this, I promise. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. I'm either sowing faithlessly or faithfully. That is, either I believe that to be true, that God is able to make his grace abound toward me, and, in, and he's the all-sufficient one, so that when I give, I, it's not creating some kind of deficit in my life that God is not more than sufficiently able to make up or even supply. Like, every time I give, I am making a statement of faith. My faith is prompted by sowing. And am, am I faithless or am I faithful? Am I functioning at the, at the level that God has called me to based on what he has distributed into my own life? You remember Jesus' words in his uh, uh, parable of the kingdom or his story of the kingdom will be like what is found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 and following. For it will be like a man who's going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. He gave to one five talents, to another two, and he gave to another one, to each one according to his ability. And then he went away. And the one who had received five went at once and traded them, and he made five more. So also the one to whom he gave two, he went and he made two more talents. But the one who received one talent dug and went and put it in the ground and hid his master's money. And when the master came back and brought all of the servants to account, the conversation went like this. Why didn't you, if you knew I was a man who reaped where I had not sown, if you knew all these things about my character, if you knew that I was a shrewd boss, if you knew that I was faithful, if you knew the expectations of my character, why did you not go to market and make the exchange? Why did you faithlessly hide it in the ground? Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that the ethic of the text is, if the things that I believe about God are true, if I really believe that he is the all-sufficient one who supplies my needs and that he has been generous to me, that I might be generous to others, I do not want God to come back into my life and say, well, if you believe all that is true, what did you do with the resources and the life that I gave you? Why have you not multiplied on it? Why have you hid it in the ground? Whether it is any of my gifts and abilities, Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that oftentimes when we see what is happening within the community around generosity, we start comparing ourselves and our capacity to others. But notice what Matthew said. The, the master came and gave to each one according to his ability, according to her ability. What you have been generously blessed with is according to God's analysis of your capacity. Some of us in the room have got billionaire talents. 
Don't know where you are, you've done a great job of concealing yourself. <laughs> Some of you have got millionaire capacity, and then the rest of us have shillionaire capacity. A shilling, right? A shilling which is worth about .000536. It's not a whole lot. But whether I'm a shillionaire or a billionaire, I'm expected to reproduce with what God has distributed into my life. That's how he's holding me accountable. I don't have to compare my life to anybody else. And so when I move with the, the sufficiency of God's grace, if I really believe that he's all sufficient, it affects the way that I distribute his grace. God has graced us with a certain ability and he will grade us. Listen, God has graced us with a certain ability and he will grade us based on the ROG, the return on grace. When I talk to the people at Morgan Stanley, I don't care none of, about none of that preamble, all that little bitty conversation like how your kids doing, how your son doing, man, no, no, no. What is the return? I don't wanna meet you for coffee. I, I, I don't care about uh, corresponding market trends. I pay you to know that. What's the ROG? And I believe that when God steps into our lives, I got it. We can have all kinds of preamble. Well, you know, God, you know, in America right now, you know, the cash and the church, you got a strained relationship and there's this prosperity thing. I didn't know what kind of church I was going to. So I wanted to just put your money in the ground real quick and let it accumulate before I decided to step out and do anything. And, you know, even with my gifts, Lord, I wanted to use my talents and gifts, but I, um, you know, I just decided, you know, church is messy. You know, I've been hurt a few times, and I don't really want to put myself out there. I didn't want to mess up your gift by distributing in ways and people that wouldn't appreciate it. And the Lord's like, cut through the preamble. What's the ROG? What's the return on grace? I gave you some stuff, and I gave you some time to multiply on that. What have you done? I gave you the gospel. What did you do with that? Well, Lord, I, you know, I'm not as chatty as Rod. I'm not as extroverted as others. I'm not as smart as that. All my, my bosses and my peers and the people that I work with, every time I say something about truth, they have these other things and I just got tired. What's the ROG? What's the return on gift? What's the return on grace that I poured into your life? So we can sow faithlessly or we can sow faith fully. And then here's the final one, verses nine through 15. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. I want you to follow this. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His, righteous, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. I thought we was talking about bread and seed. How do we get on righteousness? You will be enriched in every way, to be generous in every way, which through us, God will produce thanksgiving to God. I thought we was talking about bread and food. Thanksgiving? And then the, you jump down to verse 13, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission and your confession of the gospel. What's happening here? We can choose to give either conditionally or liberally. And what I mean by conditionally is, Lord, I'm now giving because this is the kind of seed that I gave, and therefore I expect you to give back into my life in this way, conditionally. Here is my if then. I am making this kind of donation or this kind of contribution, and I expect you to give that way. And what the Bible tells us implicitly or directly is that God is the one who has control over the type of the harvest. There will be, and there may indeed be times that God will bless us economically because we sacrificed economically. But there are also myriads and bounties of things that God wants to do in other ways that may not be exclusively economic. And so my motives are proven through my sowing. Am I willing to let God be God in the way that I sow? Or am I withholding until I believe that God is going to meet one of the promises in the way that I want the promise to be met? Proverbs chapter 16, verse 2, all the ways of man are pure in his own sight. We will have myriads of justification for this, but God is the one who is weighing the motive. And every time we give, our motives are in view. 
may not be in view, uh, in view to me or Cheryl or, 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 or Eddie or anybody else who's recounting or doing anything like that or looking, but it will be in view to the Lord. In James chapter 4, verses 2 and following, it says, You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And then you ask and you do not receive. Why? Because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. In other words, your motives are you ask God for something so that you can consume it upon your lust. God wants us to use our giving in the same way that farmers make their living. What do I mean? Good farmers always grow more than their own families could ever consume. Good farmers never grow with a view just toward their own benefit. Gardeners, maybe, but even gardeners who are good at what they do, like Eloise next door to me, will always end up with more than they could possibly consume on their own. Good farmers are in the business of both creating crops that mature and that multiply, and they make their living by being a blessing to people who they have never met. When they give and send all of that into the market. And God wants us to use our giving in the same way that the farmer makes his living. Let me help you see it. I went to the store 15 years ago and purchased a series of plants. I grew them. My mother-in-law, Dolores, came and got a piece of them. She planted them and they grew more bountifully in her context than they would in mine. I could have said, no, you can't have any pieces of my plants. You didn't buy these, I purchased these. Go get your own. She took pieces and she planted, and she produced a more bountiful harvest than I could. But it was because of her context and because of her ability. But guess what? Dolores and Arthur are getting ready to move to Atlanta, which means in the coming months, another family whose names I do not know, who I never met, will be the beneficiaries of seeds that I planted 15 years ago. I believe in much the same way that God wants to work in our lives in the gospel. Do you understand that I am today standing on a stage that was funded and financed by saints who I never met? We are declaring the gospel in microphones made by engineers whose names I cannot name, but by, by podiums that were purchased with funds that came from places that I cannot track. Do you understand that, that, the, that the, the gospel was given to me by grandparents who read it in Bibles that came from churches in the backs of pews that I could not tell you how the funds got them in there? Our generosity produces multi-generational bounty into the lives of other people. Every single one of you and me, we are beneficiaries of someone else's giving materially and spiritually. Our, uh, our bottoms are enjoying the cushioned pews of people who prayed for us with having no personal relationship with us. Isn't that something? And I believe that the same import is happening in Corinth. Hey, Corinth, y'all are the bountiful beneficiaries of gospel generosity spiritually and materially in your church. Would you now turn around and not only be God's field and his fruit, but would you now come on and would you also be his farmers? And would you plant in the lives of others around the world so that these churches that are hurting might benefit? I don't think you are bereft of any clear visibility of the gospel in today's text. But just in case you need it, if God wants me to make my living the same way a farmer makes his through his giving, God is the first and foremost. Having given his son, whose life like a seed, 
fell into the earth and died. Not for its own benefit, but for the benefit of all of those who will participate in the fruit of his resurrection. He's the first one, but then all of us who place faith in him will also be there in the consummation of the kingdom. We are beneficiaries of a seed that God originally planted. I believe that the gospel impresses upon every single heart the need to die to self, recognizing that if you do it God's way, it'll be an exponential blessing in the lives of other people that you could never imagine. When you meet a need, you're doing more than that. You're also planting a seed. Let's pray that God would help us be cheerful givers. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come this morning thanking you and praising you for opening our eyes to the beauty of your word. Lord God, I'm still like fired up and super intrigued by some of the, some of the nuances of today's text and how you just, you move so quickly from talking about bread and seeds to talking about gospel and glory and thanksgiving. Lord God, I, I, uh, there's more study to be done and we'll talk about that later. But for now, I'm asking you, oh God, to reach into the hearts and minds of people who are sitting in this audience or maybe even listening online who have a damaged view or a depraved view or an absent view or a worldly view, Lord God, of generosity because their, their view, Lord God, is limited exclusively to the material and it doesn't take into consideration the spiritual. Lord God, would you deliver, would you help, would you grab hold of those hearts? I also ask, oh God, for the person whose heart has not received the seed of the gospel, that original deposit, life-giving deposit of your son who lay down his life like a seed to die for them. Lord God, I pray that you would raise up a Christ-centered curiosity for how it is that the gospel saves their life and produces fruit of righteousness in their life. Oh God, for that person whose life is just cradled in all kinds of worldly ambition and they're figuring that they'll put you in the rearview mirror until they finally accomplish all that they want, I pray that you would grab hold of that heart, Lord God, and sit them down and cause them to see the need, Lord God, for you and your son who you sent to die for them. I pray for the person who is struggling mightily, trying to trust you in so many different ways doesn't know what to do next or where to go next, Lord God. I pray that that person would just trust you as, the, as Jehovah Jireh, their provider, the one with all sufficient grace that can meet them right where they are now and that it would abound to them, Lord God, in much fruit of righteousness. This we pray in matchless and holy name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's worship him.